Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about soft astronomy uh, today. Um, and uh, so I've been working in this for a couple of years now. Uh, it involves, so I was trying to put all the names of all the, my collaborators on. The list has gotten so long. It's now a star. But this project kind of started uh, when we were looking at pictures of Mars and um, there was a guy who's laid off from Xerox, so he's forced to retire early. And for fun, he wrote an SPH code uh, that ran on GPUs, and they sent him to talk to me because I worked um, on simulations on GPUs. And so I was trying to figure out what I would do with an SPH code. And I was, uh, you know, interested in planetary science. So we this picture of Mars. There's this big crack in it, telling you that at the time I didn't actually know any planetary astronomy. But we were like, let's crack Mars. <laughs> and so that started this whole thing off. Uh, and that led to this type of simulation technique, which is remarkably simple, but um, uh, low complexity, but remarkably powerful. And so we've used that for a number of papers I'll talk about. And then as part of that, we got curious about asteroids. And there were two missions in the last few years that came back with these beautiful pictures. This is an Cyrus Rex um, set of pictures of asteroid uh, Bennu. And um, just looking at the surface is fascinating. And uh, so it's led to some laboratory experiments. Uh, so this too is so that if you crack it, it's brittle, but also soft because you have to deform it. This is spin dynamics, but it can deform. And this is a bunch of rubble. <laughs> so I look, lumping all of these topics together under the topic of you know, soft astronomy. So, um, so with this Mars picture, you know, if you look at from space, you look at a picture of the great African rift, you know, it's this chain of lakes. And um, the explanation for that is a, a continental drift. So the, there's cracking going on that's making all these plates. But the, the assumption, is, and it's a correct assumption, is that it's slow, it takes millions of years. So geologists have to work really hard to understand things on Earth that take a really long period of time. If you look at this, is the Barrier Crater in Arizona. When people proposed this, that, that this was actually an astronomical event, it's like an impact crater, which happens in minutes. But at the time, the geology community was um, took a lot of convincing because they were used to long time scale uh, tectonic explanations for things. And so we can turn that around. And this is a, a New Horizons picture of uh, Hazma on uh, Charon. And there are craters on this, like many um, bodies in the solar system. The assumption is the craters happen in minutes. But this happens in millennia. So why? <laughs> what if this could happen uh, because of an astronomical event in a really short time scale? And so we, there are many explanations for things in the solar system that involve large collisions, like the Earth-Moon formation. Uh, so large collisions happen. And statistically, if you think about uh, an impact right in the center is pretty of, a, of an object, pretty unlikely because you have to be exactly at the, the small impact angle constraint. But if a grazing impact, it might be more likely because you have more area potentially hit, you know, think of a dart, you're more likely to hit the edge if your aim is bad. You're also much more likely to hit, not hit it, <laughs> but maybe get close. So that's, that would be a strong tidal encounter because if it's a big object, then there may be a strong tidal force during the encounter, which wouldn't last very long. Uh, so to order magnitude, uh, so you can guess at the, um, so what, to order magnitude, I want to estimate the strain, which is, the, how much it's deformed divided by the length or the radius. And a tidal encounter, so this depends on the pericenter distance. So the force depends on the pericenter distance cubed and the mass of the perturber. And if, if you assume an impulse approximation, that can give you an estimate for the change in velocity and then balance energy. So elastic uh, energy compared to kinetic energy gives you a constraint on the strain. And so, um, so this gives you a feeling for what type of strain rates would be a strain would be caused by a strong tidal encounter. And then, um, so 
the, the picture of Caron came while we were working on this, but so prior to that, we were looking at other bodies. So the, the example I did was for Dione, which is a moon in the Saturn system. So um, material properties of things aren't well that well known, ice, so maybe a gigapascal. But um, and if I took a mass ratio that's um, fairly large, you know, in fact, nearly similar, then I could estimate the, the strain. And the question is, what strain would give you cracking of the crust? And so, um, so I was looking through glacial literature to try and find estimates for um, if you have an ice sheet, how much do you have to pull it uh, to make it crack? And so that gives you something like this number. Uh, and so putting that number in tells you about what regime you're in. But I, I want to emphasize this number. So this was a numerical challenge to measure in a simulation. So if you, particularly in SPH simulations, what, what we started, what I started with with John Shaw, uh, uh, I was having trouble measuring the surface accurately to that level. And we weren't really resolving it very carefully. If you put enough particles in, you can. But this, you know, this turned out to be this big numerical challenge. So how long does it take the encounter to take place? So you can estimate a gravitational time scale we could actually use a, like a typical collision velocity. But if we work in gravitational time scales, like maybe an hour, and that gives you a strain rate. And so the, this is high strain rate. So it's not, uh, compared to what people think of in geology, which is like, you know, six orders of magnitude lower. So that gives you a feeling for like, when it, if, I'm, if I'm trying to get insight from reading um, geophysics books, it's like, does any of it apply? <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, so this is a challenge. How do you predict um, high strain rate phenomena on planetary scale? So I still don't know the answer to that, but uh, that is a, it's actually it's like not that high compared to laboratory experiments, actually. So uh, so here's one of our early simulations. So this is uh, this. Oh, yeah. OK, so. The SPH wasn't good enough. So I was looking around for other ideas on how, how to come up with simulations that would let me measure things accurately. So it's looking, because of the GPU programming, I was doing a lot of reading on uh, graphics cards uh, and, and programming techniques used in gaming. <laughs> so this is a mass spring model, random mass spring model that was used um, to make squishy stuff, you know, like blood splatting in games. And, uh, this guy, Matthew Cott, had looked at this and um, discussed the continuum limit. So the continuum limit, like lots of masses and springs. Uh, if you want to use a gaming software technique, which will be quick to program, you need to relate it to physical quantities that are relevant in, this, in the astronomical or astrophysical context. And so he had uh, measured the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio um for the random mass spring model and so that gives and and predicted it using in the continuum limit assuming that fine um, uh, stress strain uh relation so uh so this is the, so that was helpful so we we tried this and so what is actually shown here this is an n body simulation but all the point these are point masses they look like spheres but they're actually points and they're connected to the little pink things or little springs that connect them. And so this is a, um, the springs are added as extra forces within the end body simulation with the lovely viewer that Hanno Rain uh, wrote with Jacques Fayou So it's known as rebound. Um, so the, the regime we want to work in to do uh, tidal deformation that would lead to cracking is an elastic brittle regime. It's not really a plastic regime. When you think about you know, deforming things, you want it to be able to spring back. Uh, but if it has some maximum strain or, or stress condition, then we want to crack the surface. So this is what uh, I started with. And then, then what we did was extreme. Oh, let me explain first what it, what it is. So um, it's a damped uh, mass spring model. Um, so here are the spring forces. It just uh, there's a rest length so that you can keep particles apart, and then there's a damping force law that depends on the uh, strain rate. And this normal um, is just the vector connecting the point masses. So for every pair of point masses connected by a spring, you add these uh, two forces along to the gravity. So uh, 
uh, this type of thing is um, called a viscoelastic model. So if I got rid of the damping force, it would just be an elastic model. Um, you can characterize a viscoelastic model by the uh, ratio, by a time scale that's known as the viscoelastication time scale. Um, so you see that come up in some title, uh, title theories. So the uh, nice advantage of this is so all the forces are um, applied along uh, the vector connecting two point masses, and that uh, ensures that you have angular momentum conservation, which is great. The distance between every point I can measure extremely accurately, like to double precision level. And so um, this means I can measure extremely small deformations. So tidal forces usually are really small. Um, so uh, it's a low complexity code that uh, accurately conserves angular momentum and lets you model the dynamics of viscoelastic materials. So then this question, why was it not used in astrophysics? So this was like a concern. Usually when you come up with simple, something simple, it seems great. There's a reason. <laughs> but uh, so I worried about this for a long time. Uh, but it's actually a good idea. <laughs> I can say pretty much for sure now. Does so, this quote include only interactions between uh, the nearest neighbors or like all the particles in that body? So the end body is all pairs, uh, but the um, I connect the springs and I leave them fixed. I mean, you could make a more uh, general code that lets you grow springs and, uh, and, and, treat, uh, and let them disappear. That would be a plastic type of phenomena. So I haven't done that. But so this particular, uh, most of the papers we've written has been uh, all pairs, direct end body plus fixed springs between uh, pairs of masses. And then the question is, how do you choose which masses to connect up? So when we generate the point masses, I don't let them get too close together because that would be as if they were behaving like a single mass. So there's a minute, sorry, I choose random points. If it's not too close to any other point, I allow it to generate a mass node, and then I connect, connect up all pairs within a certain distance. And that gives me a number of springs per node, and you want it to have it above 10 to be a pro well approximated by a continual model. And that's, uh, that number comes from Matthew Potts work. Okay, so our first paper on this was kind of convoluted, and I figured out how to make a lot of things ex explode on the computer. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what I did uh, was I took a random mass spring model and then I connected it up with springs and then I put a shell on and then I put, um, I made the shell have some flexure to it by adding hinge forces. It's a really bad idea because these are very easily unstable. And then whenever uh, two things, but so this means it starts as a sphere though or close to a sphere. Whenever two things got too far apart, I would mark it as broken. And this gives me a way to like predict where cracks are. So this is a really uh, crude, kludgy way to predict crack propagation. So this could be done a lot better. But uh, that's a simulation of a fairly soft body with a strong tidal encounter. This one is more stronger. So it's maybe more in the regime for Dione. And this is the pattern of cracks. Um, because they're such strong encounters, they're really close. Um, all the higher order multiplications in the, in the uh, gravitational field are important. So you, you don't have a dipolar thing, you get this pattern of large cracks that's centered around the point of closest approach. So, uh, so we proposed tidal encounters as a geophysical planetary profit process. And we proposed it as an explanation for these big casmata on icy bodies on old surfaces, because right now there are not big tidal encounters happening. There could have been early in the solar system. So, um, and because we have evidence of big collisions taking place, we know this, we know there had to be strong tidal encounters. So we propose those big cracks as, as possible consequences of that. And this sim, uh, the set of simulations we did gave us some. Um, a rough uh, estimate for what types of the chasma we would see. They would be larger than the radius of the body, mainly on a hemisphere. And um, well, we don't really know what they would look like. We don't really have enough physics in the 
uh, simulations to predict you know, how deep they would be uh, and what they would actually look like. So can we apply this to Mars? And but maybe we could apply this to Mars to make Thalos Marinaris. So there is competing large body of work. Uh, question, question. Alice, could you explain again how you ap apply the surface? Because the, the cracks here are in the surface. And yeah, so that's a shell. So I made this shell and I just let it connect up to the interior. And so I just looked to see, so the shell is a bunch of part, you know, it, it's tiled. And then I just looked to see, does anything get too far apart? So this, this is assuming a ten, tensile, uh, a tensile um, start. So they getting, also, the, this surface also has a connection to some number of neighbors. Yeah, so that's a lattice. So I, the shell was a lattice. This is pretty kludgy, you know, after this, so this was the motivation for the mass spring model. We dumped that shell and never used it again because <laughs> it was very unstable. I mean, we managed to get it barely enough to work to give me something. But... Alice, uh, yeah. do you mind if I ask a question? I'm uh, remotely listening to your interesting talk. Uh, as you know, in condensed matter physics, if you have a crystal, it melts through defect formation. And the lines along which the defects actually work is dealt by statistical mechanics and so on and so forth. So when I look at your picture, it reminds me strongly of what a crystalline solid would do if it actually goes into soft state uh, through defect formation. But where these defects lie is a global thing. So uh, defects are not appearing everywhere, right? They're falling along certain lines. Could you give me some insight on how these lines are forming in your simulation? Yeah, so these types of questions would be great if we were doing a better job. <laughs> and uh, so I've not gotten into the details of crack formation or taking into account defects. So remember, it's supposed to be a planet, you know, so possibly a large moon. So defects are usually small, but not necessarily. There could be, you know, underlying uh, differences, heterogeneity, uh, crustal thickness variations from a variety of processes. And that is the reason we did not try and apply this to Mars. So I'm kind of avoiding your uh, defect uh, problem because none of it was taken into account. But coming up with more detail, so, we're making a prediction that this process had to take place. How would you tell the difference between a crack that's made by this process and some other process, like if the whole thing like cooled and expanded and then cracked the surface, which is the competing explanation. And so you would have to do quite a bit more work to uh, make predictions that would let you differentiate between other processes for cosmata formation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So moving on, <laughs> we got rid of the shell. And um, so I put this simulation together and I went to the DPS and I ran into Michael Ferensky, uh, Michael Ferensky who works on uh, tidal spin down with this uh, you know, frequency dependent viscoelastic uh, models uh, for the spin down. And this, what it is, it's actually a binary, equal mass binary. And you can see it uh, deforming the, uh, this body, which results. So that's a point mass, of, and it looks big, but it's a point mass. And then if, we, if you wait, you can notice that this thing is slowly starting to spin. So it was initially not spinning. Uh, so we're in the inertial frame of this guy, but it's, uh, it's not a rotating frame. So the tidal perturbation is causing this thing to spin up. So this is, you know, spin, spin up or spin down, <laughs> tidal spin up, spin down. So this is, so even though we started with this fixed, you know, in the solar system, many bodies are tidally locked with something else. So the moon, we always see the same face towards us. It's tidally locked with the earth. And so this process that our simulation is just showing completely naturally is showing tidal spin down. <laughs> So, um, so here's kind of a, um, a, a cartoon of what's happening. So here's our perturber. Here's the body that we're resolving. The tidal force is quadrupolar, so it's pulling it out. So if the spin, um, so if it's relaxing really quickly, so you pull it, but it's also spinning, if it's relaxing really fast, so it instantly deforms, then it's perfectly aligned and there's no torque. 
If it's really slow at relaxing, and so it takes a really long time to deform, it stays round and it does, there's no torque. So it's this intermediate um, setting where the body has time to respond uh, that gives you what's known as this lag angle, and that allows a torque uh, between uh, this body and that body. And so the prediction is that you have a frequency dependence to the torque. Um, so this is symmetrical, uh, and the frequency um, you describe in terms of the viscoelastic relaxation time, and the peak uh, torque is when the um, tidal frequency matches the viscoelastic relaxation time. So, uh, so this is a, a common formula for the torque. It's usually written in terms of uh, something that's called a love number times uh, lag. So we can call this whole thing a quality function. And for people who apply tidal torques, you're going to recognize this Q thing. So that's, you know, like the lag to the minus one. And um, yeah, so this is just to ground people for who used to working on, on this. So I ran into Michael Lefrimsky and I said, look, I have a simulation technique that can relate this scholastic model directly to tidal spin down. And um, so our forces, the, um, the uh, damping force is put in parallel with the spring force. So that's known as a Kelvin Voigt, the scholastic model. And um, what he was using what's known as a complex compliance to describe the stress strain relation, which is frequency dependent. And they like to use the Maxwell model, which is the spring and the damper in series. And so he said, you need to make your model be a Maxwell model. And I said, no, you need to make your theory be a Helden Voigt model. And this would have been the end of the comparison, except there was a postdoc uh, listening. This is Julia Foucault, and he was like, oh, this is trivial to calculate. So the next day he sent me a prediction with the Kelvin Voigt uh, um, compliance. And the day later, I can't find the word. Here we are. Okay. A day later, this is like delays, I had points on a line. So here is the line that he predicted and the red dots were my simulation output. So I measured the uh, quality effect, I actually measured the semi-major axis drift, but you know, you can turn one into the other. So it's the right shape, it has the right peak. Uh, we were just a little bit high and we published the paper anyways. It was like, it doesn't matter, 30%, that's great. <laughs> so it was a 30% uh, discrepancy. And uh, so I can tell you why later after we published it. The reason was he did the calculation assuming that um, the Poisson, that, that it was uh, incompressible, but our, um, the mass spring model, uh, the simple, you know, random mass spring model that we have has a Poisson ratio of a quarter, so there's some compressive uh, viscosity in there. And so that gives you this extra, <laughs> extra torque that we didn't take into account. So we figured that out later. So tidal spin down, it can be direct, directly simulated. Um, so our simulations are directly tying the rheology of the body to the tidal torque and the spin down rate. Uh, so that's cool. And that this in this field, this has only be done, only been done analytically. Uh, so it's kind of cool when you have a simulation technique that's new. Uh, we, we predicted the shape, um, the predicted shape matched the shape we measured numerically, but with this 30% discrepancy, which we later tracked down and associated with the lack of um, compressibility in the theoretical computation, rather than a problem with the numerical computation. So originally we were like, new numerical, new numerical technique, it's going to be the numerical Problem, you know, a problem with numerical uh, simulation. So we got a little bit more sophisticated afterwards. And uh, so after publishing that paper, um, Darren Magazine said, you got to look at Haumea. Now, Haumea is this elongated body and um, the title to computations usually assumes spherical bodies because it's easier to calculate. And so we didn't really have any constraints on what shape we're spinning. So we ran a simulation that's like this. There's the perturber. There's this uh, um, 
non-round thing with a lot of particles in it. This is under principal axis rotation and zero obliquity, so there's no tilt. Um, and um, so we just uh, looked at the tidal spin up or spin down rate, and we did a bunch of different shapes. Sorry, is Haumea a, a, a binary object? Yeah, so it has a couple moons and lately, so we, we did not resolve the issue of formation of Haumea. It was a good thing because right after this paper, a ring was discovered in the system. <laughs> so I think there's more going on in the Haumea system. But the, the question was, is the tidal spin down rate a lot higher than people thought because it's not round? It is spinning quite fast. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the, the dots here are all these different shaped bodies and I'm measuring the spin down rate and I'm pegging things to the sphere down at the bottom here. Um, the lines are a scaling relation that we found numerically and then argued with a simple, you know, um, generalization of Hooke's law. So this is my about minus one, it's slightly better fit with a little bit different, but you know, guess at the scaling law based on the numerical measurements. So that was cool. <laughs> Then the next, one of the other things we did was we looked at damping of non-principal axis rotation. And so if you uh, have an angular momentum vector that's not aligned with one of the body uh, principal axes, it will process. Um, so we're, we're, we're here we're percent, uh, running either prolates or oblates. And uh, because of the procession, the particles are feeling um, periodic acceleration. So there's a periodic stress strain cycling. Uh, with a stress-free boundary. Um, and uh, to, to hint this uh, non-principal angle, which is the angle between the angular momentum and the body principal axis, we're gonna uh, see that again. And so this is great because new numerical technique, the question is, does it match any predictions? So these lines are all predictions by Breiter et al. Uh, so these, we're measuring the dissipation rate in the springs, not, um, works, but uh, so the annual momentum should be conserved. So we're measuring energy dissipation rates and over orders of magnitude for different axis ratios and different shapes and different on principle um, angles, uh, we're really close to the predictions over, over orders of magnitude in the, in the dissipation rates. And so this was like, yes, points on lines. <laughs> So in order to do this, I had to understand the uh, frequency dependence quite well because uh, you know we're doing this Kelvin Voigt uh, model and so we have different frequency dependence the predictions. So there was quite a bit of scaling uh, and understanding needed to get the dots on the line. But let me, to summarize, so we can simulate viscoelastic and tidal evolution of homogeneous, inhomogeneous, so I didn't talk about that, but you can change the, you know, you can change the elastic modulus, you know, change the spring strengths, the density, you can put whatever, you can have a dense core, so you can do inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous bodies, we looked at non-round, we did look at anisotropic elastic bodies, so these are actually crystal lattices, they're weird because they're anisotropic, but you can simulate all of it, <laughs> it's like without much effort, and scaling of measurements, motivated us to understand something that hadn't been computed and the study of wobble damping shows us simulation techniques really accurate. So that's just great. Yeah, question. Is the only thing you need to change to look for convergence, the number of springs between the different masses? I mean, what is numerical convergence for this technique? Yeah, so um, you would want more particles. So we're using, so we're using, uh, Guideline is more than 10, maybe 15 springs per node. So that lets that sets the maximum spring length. Um, so if you don't have very many particles, then your biggest spring is actually a significant fraction of the radius of the body. So we did do some convergence that well, not really convergence. We did look at different numbers of particles. Right now we're limited by the gravity computation because with 15 springs per node, that's n. And gravity is n squared if you're using a direct gravity. I did try tree code with uh, Ron Pano's uh, tree code and rebound. It wasn't accurate enough, so I got different results. So I didn't, haven't been using it. So, uh, so that's an issue. So, uh, so we haven't been able to scale to very large part of numbers of particles. 
because we're limited by the direct gravity. But I also haven't parallelized this code. Everything I'm showing you has been done in a few minutes on the laptop. So if the technique is useful, there's a long way to go. Numerically, you know, more complicated, um, so just, you know, bigger simulations. Yes, Jeremy? Is your, are your strings, uh, strings strictly harmonic because? No, because they have a rest length. Well, yes, but I mean, it, it, then it they are the yeah. square. Except so, for this rest length issue, they're harmonic. Okay, so it seems to me that, you know, in a very high compression, the pressure just goes like the density. Yeah, so I've been, we, um, yeah, so, so how do you so choose? So it's too massive, it's a thing. Yeah, so how do you choose your spring strengths? So, um, so the time step of the code is set by the speed of elastic waves between nodes. So uh, usually I want to run my simulations faster, so I make the body pretty soft. But um, then with that in mind, then you can figure out, uh, put that in units of the gravitational energy density of the whole body, and that will tell you how important self-gravity is. So at the beginning of that title, spin down simulation, you see it bounce, and that's because the initial conditions were not quite right. So, so far I've been running in the setting where the body is fairly rigid, but just soft enough that self-gravity won't let it implode. And the time step being set by this particular problem, which, uh, you know, the time, it's like a CFL condition, which tells me that I want soft bodies, so I don't have to wait too long to do the simulation. Question. Yeah, I, another uh, the, uh, it's very interesting what you show, and you did hint at it by saying that the convergence study would probably require changing N. What I was thinking about was the ratio of the surface to volume would probably have a significant effect in determining what is going on within. Uh, that is a more interesting question to me than the number N. So I kind of have a question, a way to answer that. And so the title computations are actually um, the, so they go as R to really high power, like the sixth power or something like that. So you could really worry about it. is the surface affecting my simulation result. So in particular, like, you know, a particle on the surface has fewer springs connected to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it could be floppier. So, but the tidal force is dominated by what the interior is doing because the stress is largest in the interior. And the amount of the stress depends on the radius. So oddly, so we did try changing the number of springs per, per particle on the surface to see if the floppiness of the surface was affecting the results. And it was remarkably not a strong effect. So, but the largest spring in many of our simulations, the largest spring is a significant fraction of the radius. So we aren't really reaching, you know, a continuum limit with the simulations. So, you know, we could do better possibly in the future by getting off my laptop <laughs> and, and looking again. So. Okay, so uh, it's more fun to do applications than it is to worry about these numerical details. So let's move on to an application. So while I was at the DBS, the first results from the New Horizons mission were presented by Mark Showalter. And uh, so I'm gonna focus on the four minor, minor satellites, um, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra. They have near integer ratios with the pluto charon uh, rotation period. So you can think of Pluto and Charon that's in here as being a binary system. And this is a, these are moons in a circumbinary disk. Well, there isn't really a disk, but they're moons. <laughs> Uh, uh, orbiting them in the plane in their low eccentricity and low inclination. So they're probably more than this. So there were two surprises from the early uh, New Horizons mission data. So um, because most moons are tidally locked in the solar system, the expectation was they would be nearly tidally locked. They were, it was known that they weren't round because they saw variations in light curves done with HST, with, with the Hubble Space Telescope. So what was predicted was that they would be tumbling like Hyperion. 
And so let me go back here and see if I can get this to right again. So this is what, what was predicted, a tumbling thing because they're not round and they're nearly tightly locked. What was seen was they were spinning fast. So they hadn't spun down. So that was for surprise. So what I mean by spinning fast is the ratio of the spin to the mean motion is bigger, much bigger than one. It's like seven or 13 pence. I put the numbers in there if you're interested. And Mark Walter showed this little cartoon uh, to illustrate that. The other surprise was they all have high obliquity. So obliquity means that their spin axis is very different than the orbital axis. And uh, so this shows that the, all the obliquities are near 90 degrees. And uh, if they were aligned with the orbital axis, which we would call zero obliquity, it would have been at this star here on this uh, all right deck plot. So uh, yeah, so in hindsight, the fact that they hadn't spun down is kind of expected. Um, so if you actually calculate the spin down time using uh, your best guess is the rigidity of ice and a cube that might be typical of solids, the spin down time would have been 10 to the 12 years. So somehow two papers were written, were written predicting that, it, that the minor satellites would be chaotic without checking the spin down time. <laughs> so that's kind of weird, but uh, that's what happened. So um, with the obliquities, um, are they primordial or not? Uh, so if they were just born at these odd angles, um, then we have nothing to explain. So, so that's a question, should things be, be born at low, low obliquity or not? So if they're accreting from gas, like the giant planets maybe in our solar system, you might predict low obliquities. But if there's late stage accretion from large planetesimals in the disk, then you might predict random obliquities. And then there's this question of, well, are they near enough 90 to be significant or not? Independent of that, we just said, let's explore mechanisms to change their obliquities. Sorry, just a very quick question. Uh, what about the nature of uh, the, so they haven't spun down, but what's, what about the nature of these initial spins? Where are they coming from? Was it yeah. encounters or? Something? So they're all quite different, right? So uh, yeah, so why are they spinning quickly? They are spinning quickly and they're not all the same. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I don't think there's any predictions from the models like Kenyon's models. So Kenyon's models was, they're more um, trying to figure out what the, you know, how to form them and maybe account for the axis, uh, the, the near integer periods with like migration. In case, um, so to put this in perspective, we were doing simulations where we were going up a number of particles and now we wanna do long evolution Simulations. So we're going the other way. Uh, few particles, um, and I'm not going to really worry about the material properties, but I can still run tidal computations because the spring springs can still damp. So the simulations we're, we're going to do now are one resolved body with two point mass perturbers, um, and so this actually tells you, you know, how much, how far away. <laughs> Sticks is from the Pluton Heron mm -hmm. binary. So, this is the type of simulations we're running. So, sticks with tidal evolution alone. So, you can see the spin is uh, dropping, and these lines are the spin orbit resonances. Uh, and you don't really see your capture or big obliquity. So, the obliquity is shown here. Obliquity, you do see the obliquity vary, but it's not really associated with spin resonance. And we're starting to see stuff that hard to predict. So we're seeing principal non-principal axis rotation. This little yellow stuff is sometimes being excited. We didn't know how to identify this. So when we're running these big, these long simulations, we see resonant phenomena. Often we don't know how to explain it. <laughs> so the simulation is not, there are fewer assumptions involved in the simulation than there are in a lot of the analytical comp computations. In any case, the high spin, spin rate is high enough that we don't see spin orbit resonance capture or attitude instability or obliquity variation because of these. But we do see this jump, but we only, jumps in obliquity, we only see that with sticks. We don't see it in other uh, bodies when, they, when we run tidal, spit, tidal evolution alone. Uh, so, you know, maybe we could explain sticks high obliquity, but we wouldn't be able to explain Yix's obliquity. Um, and of course, we still have to track down what's causing this intermittent obliquity variation. 
So I mentioned, you know, you, you see resonances. This one we tracked down to be a spin binary resonance. This one turned out to be tumbling, but we don't know how to predict it. Um, just kind of give you a feeling for the complexity and, you know, kind of fun trying to track down what's going on. So, um, so then we started running simulations where we let Heron migrate away from Pluto. Um, and then you can capture uh, sticks or nicks into a mean motion resonance. And so this is um, the uh, orbit uh, ratio, and you can see it freezes when you get into the three to one resonance. Sometimes there's uh, inclination sensitivity and you can see orbit tilt excited. But the main thing to notice here is while we're on the approach to that residence, the obliquity just goes right up. So uh, there's some kind of mechanism causing big obliquity variations near mean motion resonances. And this also worked for sticks, uh, or NIX. It's worked for NIX. So this is a simulation of NIX, only NIX is near the four to one mean motion resonance instead of the three to one mean motion resonance. In this case, we saw both eccentricity and orbital uh, in the capture and really high obliquity swings. Um, so the question is, how do you figure out what's causing it? <laughs> and um, so, uh, so one approach to try to identify what physical process is involved with resonance is you try and look for a fixed angle. Uh, so to illustrate that, you know, if you have a um, rotation period of Charon and the rotation period of Styx, and they're in a three to one ratio, three to one mean motion resonance, you integrate, these are free, uh, this is a period, you turn that into frequencies and you integrate, you get angles. And so this is like the location of Charon and its orbit or the longitude. And this is the longitude of Styx and it equals a constant. And so if we can find angles that are constant in the simulations, maybe they'll give us clues to what process is causing these obliquity changes. So when we're looking for angles, since the obliquity is involved, uh, we need to describe you know, the tilt angle of the spinning body. So this is the obliquity is the tilt, but then you can figure out what angle on the orbit plane um, this vector is. So you project this down and you get an angle and so that's like a procession angle. And so then we went back to the simulations and looked, so, you know, plot box of angle combinations, and you look to see which one freezes during this when it's going up. And this one turns out to be the one that's frozen, which is implying that, that a process that gives a per, uh, in, in a Hamiltonian model, the perturbation would depend on this angle. So it's a spin procession mean motion resonance because it involves the uh, mean longitude of the body, the sticks, and the binary, that would be Charon's uh, location, and the procession angle of sticks. And so to kind of illustrate that, uh, you can turn this around and in the orbital frame moving the sticks, the binary appears to orbit twice for a single uh, spin procession of time. And so, yeah, props. It's like, yeah, so, uh, so if we think of the uh, sticks as being the top. So yeah, so and then if I if I start moving, which I have to let it spit, tilt over. Okay, now it's tilting over a little bit. But if I do, if I kind of move my finger at the procession rate, I can start to tilt it over without processing. But if I do this. I can tilt it over. And, and also, if you're really good at this, you can get it to come back up. I'm sorry, not very good. But anyways, that's the idea is you do this and you do it at the procession rate and it slowly tilts over or tilts back up. So that's the analogy. <laughs> you have a perturbation at the procession rate. Okay, so to summarize, tidal spin down times are long for Pluto satellites. We should have known better, or other people should have known better. <laughs> tidal evolution was done alone, does, doesn't explain anything but sticks is obliquity. Actually, the same resonance turns out to be relevant for that phenomenon. The outward migration of Charon causes capture and new motion resonance and simultaneously can lift the obliquities. It's a new resonant uh, mechanism. So see work by Sarah Milholland for a similar uh, resonance in a different setting. 
So it's a commensurability between spin precession and mean motion. And uh, if you calculate its strength, it's not necessarily low order in inclination and uh, eccentricity. The direct torque terms may be important. That's our work. Um, the effect on the secular uh, uh, precession might be important. That's Sarah's work. Um, so there's more work to be done analytically on understanding this type of resonance. It can work for all of Pluto and Charon satellites. We only simulated two of them, but there's no reason why it wouldn't work on all of them. And the implications are that the satellites were previously in mean motion resonances and possibly this happened while migration took place. So while it was embedded in a disk. So I haven't seen updates in models for formations, but this may have, if this mechanism accounts for the liquidies, then you know, maybe we get constraints on the uh, evolution and formation. So we well, have a little bit more time, but I'm not going to get to the lab astro, I think. <laughs> okay. So the last, the latest thing we worked on is just this summer uh, is binary asteroid evolution. So um, all up to this point, we had only resolved a single body, and now we're going to resolve two. So we have uh, primary and secondary. And so we're motivated in part because of this mission that's supposed to go to a binary asteroid next year called DART, uh, which stands for this. But the goal of DART is to fire a missile at uh, di uh, Dimorphos, which is this one, uh, and see what happens. <laughs> so you can see somehow they didn't want to use the word missile. So missile is not part of the acronym, right? But anyways, that's the, the goal. So there are two real mysteries in binary asteroid literature. One is if you estimate the um, the title is the dissipation of the material from wobble damping from statistics of single asteroids. You get something like 10 to the 11 pascals. But in the binary setting, people estimate something two orders of magnitude or three orders of magnitude lower. Okay, so that's like sort of single asteroids different than binary asteroids. Who's wrong? So a lot of ways out of this, but it's um, mysterious. The other disconcerting thing is that this radiation effect called biorp, which is um, radiation forces can cause a torque on the, that pulls the secondary, makes the secondary drift either out or in. And uh, the rate is really fast. So by fast, it means they should fall apart in 10 to the five years. But the lifetime of a new NEA, it's a near Earth asteroid, which this is in that category, is 10 to the seven years. So it's like, how do you keep binary asteroids from falling apart? And about one sixth of NEAs are binary. So it's like a large number that you have to prevent from falling apart. So I, the, the cool thing is, we maybe have a solution to both of these problems. <laughs> So that's can you, cool. Can you remind us where the 10 million year number comes from? That's a statement about just the orbital dynamics in the orbit yeah, so inner solar system. Yeah, they're crossing into the inner solar system. And so if you integrate how long do they last in orbit crossing, they, yeah. they just don't last that long. Like they crash into Earth, for example. Yeah, so here's the simulation. Here's a simulation. It's tidally locked, kind of. <laughs> this guy's spinning, and we're in the frame. Moving well, so I'm going to get to that again. <laughs> what do we see? So, um, so we let the started the secondary outside of tidal lock, and uh, we let it spin down. And so here's the spin down. So this is spin um, when something goes into the spin synchronous state. Um, one of the um, it's a nice prediction by Jack Wisdom that it has to enter a tumbling state prior to get it into the tidal box spin synchronous state. So that you see is obliquity variations and you see this damping of libration. So libration is like the long axis pointing towards the primary. Then I looked at the inclination of the long axis and then there's this NPA angle coming up again. And so for a long time, so the spin down time is really fast. So think about how long this took place. If this didn't take very long. The non-principal axis rotation is taking a long time. And most of this is due to what we're calling short axis tilt. So the short axis is rolling back and forth. Um, and it's long lived. 
So if you have a problem accounting for the spin down time and you're trying to explain why many secondaries appear to be in spin synchronous states, we have a worse problem now because it takes a really long time after it enters the spin synchronous state for the um, non-principal axis rotation to damp. So this says that in a different way here, the spin down times and I used values for single asteroids. So this is kind of inflated, but there are various proposed ways to lower the um, material strength and raise the dissipation rate um, proposed in the literature. Uh, uh, this is, yeah, so this, this is a list. The two main things are the light curves, which often, uh, say that the secondary is in a spin synchronous state don't are not necessarily sensitive enough to figure out if it's in a non-principal axis rotation state. So the assumption is that it is, and by your averages to zero if it's tumbling, but is huge if it's in a non-principal if it's in a principal axis rotation state, and nobody knows what happens if it's in between. And so that's how much can you reduce by or by having a variety in between tidal lock and tidal lock with non principal axis rotation and tumbling? So that's what we're going to, this is why, how we're going to try and solve these problems. So, um, so let me show you kind of what I mean by these terms. So the, um, the angle between the long axis and the direction to the primary, that's vibration. Um, so this angle is zero if it's tightly locked, but this short axis could go back and forth this way. And that's kind of like this roll for a plane if you point the nose towards the primary. And then this can also, the whole thing can go up and down, which I'm calling here long axis inclination. There's better words for this. Uh, uh, Matiak too calls it barrel roll. Uh, but yeah, probably in future people are going to call it that because it's better than short axis tilt. So going back to the simulation, you can see so the long axis points towards this, but the whole thing is doing that. So and that lasts a really long time uh, in the simulation. So it takes a really long time for it to damp. So um, so now we're going to try like. We did tidal damping for the um, binaries, but now I'm going to force migration of, of the binary. This is as if I'm imposing like um, a biorp force, which would be a adiabatic uh, variation in semi major axis. So what do you see? So if you start with an in tidal lock, which is down here, and you let it drift in, you can see it jumps in the obliquity. Eventually, the libration angle goes up, and at some point at the end of this thing, the whole thing uh, falls apart. And then um, this obliquity jump is associated with excitation of long axis inclination. So the, the point of all this is that if by your start is effective and the thing is drifting, we can excite the rotation state, and then that can shut down by your <laughs> potentially shut down by your. So, so there's multiple ways possibly when you can title spin down, it has to go into a non-principal axis rotation state, which lasts a long time. But then also you can re potentially re-excite it later on. And however this happens, you're probably going to reduce the drift rate and that will extend the lifetime of the um, of the asteroid. So I was trying to figure out these resonances. It's just like also uh, a challenge. <laughs> we haven't done that yet. So how do we um, predict the bi or uh, torque? So uh, since it's radi it depends on radiation forces, uh, that means we need a shape model. And um, so we were simulating the um, di Dynamos dimorphous system because of the dart mission, but there isn't a good shape model for the secondary. So I went to find a shape model for an actual se secondary and Squanet, which is the secondary of uh, the mashup system, is really nicely characterized by radar observations. So we're using the Squanet shape model. Uh, we played around with different roughnesses and perturbed it in um, various ways. So 
So once you have a shape model, you have little facets all over the uh, body, and then you can compute the radiation force. And this is a little cartoon showing you the warp effect. So radiation forces give you what's known as your Yarkovsky effect, which is orbital drift, and it gives you spin up or spin down, that's known as warp. And then it gives you drift of the binary semi-major axis, which is known as bi warp. So, uh, so I started by, it's like, wow, if I taking the output of my spin simulations and putting them into a bio calculation, wow, this is gonna be hard. So I took a shape model and just started randomly perturbing it as if it were uh, under this short axis, changing with the short axis tilt angle. As a function of the short axis tilt angle, so these are different shape models. I think this one is that one and this one is that one. Um, the um, by your B coefficient, which tells you the torque, uh, drops. And once you get to about 50 or 60 degrees, it drops to zero. And this dot's really important because other people have calculated the by your torque on this shape model. And we were worried that we were getting the computation wrong. And so our red dot matches their black dot. So that's confirmation. The other confirmation is the sphere gives you zero. <laughs> so two checks on the code. It's like the first time you write a code, try to think of ways to check it. Then we got over the whole, why are we being too lazy to take the output of the simulations and use the actual angles of the simulated body to predict the bio torque. And the reason we got over it is because there's this cute, cute little algorithm that lets you relate node positions of a body um, to a, you know, some uh, other orientation um, by um, computing an, uh, an eigenvalue of a matrix. <laughs> so this describes it, but it, it's called the Cabbage algorithm. And so and you can also make it into a quaternion that does the rotation. And so if I keep track of this matrix, which is uh, an output it during the simulations, I will be able to rotate it, the body to some original or principal axis setting and know what that rotation is at every step in the simulation. That's great. So this, so I changed the code to output this, we ran all the simulations and then took this and rotated the squanet shape model and then computed the bio torque. So number of steps. And this is what you get. So um, while the non-principal axis rotation is going on, the bio torque averages to zero. And then as the non-principal axis drops, you start to see it stop shifting directions and slowly rises. Uh, and at the end of this simulation, it was, you know, about um, 0.05, but that's four times lower than the predicted biorp torque uh, in principal axis rotation state. And so we use the other simulation of the migration one that started, um, uh, yeah, uh, let's see, this is a migration simulation that had it's a different simulation that has the non-principal axis rotation slowly decaying and going further closer to zero. And this one, you can see it slowly rises till you start approaching um, the value that's predicted if the thing were in a, in a, non, in a principal axis rotation state. So previously, the bio calculations either assumed the bio torque was zero because it was tumbling or very high because it was in a principal axis rotation state, really we're seeing this whole continuum of phenomena. And when the angle drops to about 45 degrees, that's when the bio starts uh, happening. And so you have this kind of transition um, where, you, where, you, where you have to let the body go down to um, lower the non-principal axis angle enough before bio can start happening. So it's a, a nice way of actually, you know, shutting in, in, in this state, you completely shut it down and then you slowly allow it uh, to resume as the non-principal axis rotation uh, starts up. So to conclude, non-principal axis rotation in a secondary and a binary is long lived. So if it's detected, then the material property discrepancy between binary and single asteroids is less bad. So you can ameliorate, ameliorate it. I mean, it may still be real that binary asteroids are softer and more dissipative, but the problem is less bad. 
Non-principal axis rotation can reduce or shut down biorp, and that means that you can extend the lifetimes, uh, even taking into account the biorp torque. And uh, we actually have a prediction, you know, uh, so if you, um, right, at, right before our paper was posted on the archive this summer, the DART team, Igrusa uh, et al, um, proposed that the missile would excite non principal axis rotation in the secondary, but we're predicting it's already in <laughs> non principal axis rotation state. So that's kind of cool, you know, a completely different conclusion. Both of us agreed on this role uh, type of phenomena. So. Okay, so let me check the time because uh, I was thought that the talk would take longer. Yes, yeah, so it's new. So I think it's a good time to like, how long am I I'm supposed to end now? Yeah. Okay, good. So we'll just end. Um, wanted to talk about Lab Astro, but you're going to have to ask me now. <laughs> we'll end there. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you very much for a very nice uh, talk. Uh, in my view, what you described, uh, this set of problems that you explored, that's sort of in the linear regime, when the body still stays intact, even in the beginning when you were talking about cracking. But in astrophysics, quite often, we have uh, tidal disruption events. For example, asteroids disrupted by white dwarfs, uh, leading to their pollution, or should make a Levy comet, and so on. So these methods, uh, can they be extended to treat tidal disruptions, to go into the highly nonlinear regime and then treating individual objects? Because this is, after all, SPH. So is, is there a way to kind of make a jump from a single body to multiple ones? Well, so tidal disruption is really fast. And I mean, SPH does it really well. But also these soft sphere models, um, like um, they do it really well, too. So I would not use my viscoelastic model for that problem. I mean, obviously, you need to make some transition, but can you come up with some criteria yeah, so for? The nice thing about my model is very good for small deformations and and it conserves any momentum. But if you're doing a fast tidal encounter, maybe you don't care that much about exact conservation of angular momentum because you're not doing it for a million orbits, and you don't really care about the uh, accuracy. Uh, to this level. <laughs> so I would say I would not use this type of simulation technique. Now, the soft sphere models can show this viscoelastic uh, phenomena, and so can SPH. So I would work harder at put, you know, making sure the physics for that was right in those simulation techniques. Yeah, I think you actually just answered my question, but I was very interested in this make origin of spins, and it sounds like there are a lot of objects in the solar system that are spinning rapidly, and maybe this, if I remember correctly, Oumuamua was spinning too rapidly, uh, but it sounds like you don't want to use this model for things that may have originated in impulse events or uh, uh, something that happened very quickly, right? Is that the... Oh, or is that still an interesting question to ask? Well, we did do the wobble damping because we were inspired by Uluwa, but we didn't actually have anything new to say about it. Uh, so we can certainly do a wobble damping estimate for Uluwa. But formation by, if you were going to form Uluwa by a tidal disruption, again, I would say use yeah. a movement that does the physics better uh, and, and don't use something that's super good at measuring teeny deformations, which is our particular niche of expertise. <laughs> yeah. Um, Alice, there's yeah. a question on Zoom from uh, Scott Tremaine. Oh, hi, Scott. Uh, hi, Alice. Uh, the uh, thanks for the talk. The the picture you the enlarged picture you show on the screen, uh, which is I guess Bennu, um, has this bulge at its equator, almost like an equatorial ridge. Uh, do you have any insight from your simulations on on why it has that peculiar shape? So Bennu with this, this is a spin probably a deformation due to spin out events from torque, uh, you know, uh, from your spin up. And uh, I would refer you to Dan's work uh, by Dan Shearer's group, or there's a Japanese group uh, 
and Paul Sanchez's work. And so there's numerous groups that have simulated this with soft sphere simulations. So ours is not allowing plastic deformation or material flow. So I haven't tried to do something like this, but you know, there's a whole body of work on it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Another question on Zoom from uh, Wendy Liu. Hello. So I want to ask about the the sub, the suppression of the bio orb uh, spin down rate. So the discrepancy, as you mentioned, between the you know, observation and theory is like two orders of magnitude from 0.1 million years to 10 million years. Do you actually get two orders of magnitude suppression in the bio orb coefficient? Depends on the non-principal axis rotation angle. Yeah, the short axis tilt. So there's reversals in the beginning of our simulation, and then it averages to zero. Uh, so yeah, zero is certainly uh, pretty close to zero. <laughs> so yeah, you can get rid of it altogether until it damps down and then it will start to evolve. But you could re-excite it. So it's not like, you know, maybe if you re-excite the non-principal axis rotation, you can keep them alive for longer. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons I'm trying to predict that we're gonna see it and see this see some in non-principal axis rotation states is your bias. The things want, the binaries that survive are the ones that are going to last longer. That's like kind yes. of obvious, right? But yeah, so there's a selection effect too or in, in that sense. So if it, if bi orb starts to ex take place, then the binary can disrupt and then it's not a binary. <laughs> so I know it sounds kind of obvious, but <laughs> But none of the population models have looked at this. And so instead, there's elegant work trying to stop by work with tidal forces. Uh, so Seth, Seth Jacobson has a paper on that. And they also get very low mean Q values. Um, but these population models maybe should be redone now, maybe with uh, mm -hmm. some other, some more rotational dynamics. <laughs> Thanks. Jerry? Just, just a comment on spins. There's a suggestion, I think, that um, maybe some of the Kuiper Belt objects form from, uh, by something like the streaming instability. So they started out as large, dispersed clouds of particles, which then uh, condensed, you know, squeezing out the gas and so forth, in which case, high spin is a pretty natural outcome. Oh, cool. I did not know that. Ms. Vorning, Ms. Vorning, and Well, that's great. Cool. <laughs> because just because of the moment, yeah. angular momentum calculation. I haven't actually simulated anything in the curve bill yet, oh, unless, unless you count on Pluto. <laughs> uh, is there another question from uh, Amitav Pachargi on Zoom, or is that uh, your previous uh, hand? Up? It's a fossil hand, I apologize. So if there are no further questions, let's uh, thank Alice again for her.